When I moved to A and G, I moved to an OFDM radio, and it's a different radio, and so the channel bandwidth is actually different. And both the A and the G radio actually occupy a 20 megahertz channel, and that's what you saw on the previous slide, is that my signal was occupying a 20 megahertz channel within the 2.4 gigahertz band. In fact, that previous picture was 802.11g. So 802.11g is defined to operate in the 2.4 gigahertz band and occupy a 20 megahertz channel. 802.11a is the same effective radio as G, is still an OFDM radio, occupies 20 megahertz, but is deployed in the 5 gigahertz band. And as we now know, if I'm deployed in a higher frequency, my signal doesn't propagate as far. We just talked about that a moment ago. Now, when we talk about A, B, and G, those standards were actually defined to be deployed in a specific frequency band. 802.11n is band independent, so the standard itself can be deployed in a range of different frequency bands. And where we see it primarily being deployed is both in the 2.4 and in the 5 gigahertz band. The other thing to note is that 802.11n, for backward compatibility with A and G, also supports a 20 megahertz channel. And this allows you to have it coexisting with an A deployment in the 5 gigahertz band or a G deployment in the 2.4 gigahertz band. But 802.11n also defines a 40 megahertz channel. And if you go to a 40 megahertz channel in comparison with a 20 megahertz channel, what I'm able to do is double your data rates. You can consider the channel bandwidth a little bit like a water pipe. If I want to get more water through a pipe, I need a bigger pipe. And so it is with spectrum. If I want to get up to higher data rates, one of the techniques is to go to wider bandwidths. So when I deploy 802.11n, if I'm able to deploy in a 40 megahertz channel compared to the 20 megahertz channel, I can double my data rates. And so that's very important consideration. So here's another illustration, and this is actually my home network, and you can see it's called Avril's Network. Now, I actually live out in the countryside, so there's not a lot of deployments around me, not a lot of interference. And what you can see here is that my neighbor, whose access point is called a D-Link, um, is deploying 802.11g and they're occupying a 20 megahertz band on channel 1. So what I did is I moved my access point to operate up on channel 11 and I defined for 802.11n channel 11 as the primary channel and then channel 7 as the secondary channel which gave me a total of 40 megahertz, which means that I can actually operate in the 2.4 gigahertz band using a 40 megahertz channel, and therefore I'm able to get up to the much higher data rates. Now, a couple of things I want to point out here. First, notice that I said channel 11, and then as a secondary channel, channel 7. And you might say, why didn't I say channel 6? And the reason is, remember earlier I told you that the channel separation between channel 6 and channel 11 was 25 megahertz. Well here, what I'm trying to deploy is two adjoining 20 megahertz channels. I don't want a gap between them. So when I define my secondary channel to go with my primary 20 megahertz channel, I need it adjoining to it. So I need to define 11 and 7, or 10 and 6, or 1 and 5. They must be adjoining together in order to get my 40 megahertz channel. The second thing I want to point out is I mentioned to you that I'm in the countryside, and therefore I'm able to get a 40 megahertz channel. Most people cannot in the 2.4 gigahertz bands. And the reason is, is that if the access point detects any interference, 
it'll reduce itself back to a 20 megahertz channel. The reason it does that is this channel is unlicensed, which means I'm sharing it with other technologies, with other users, other people that might be deploying wireless LANs or cordless phones or baby monitors or security systems. And in that situation, they could be deploying on the band. And so to reduce the interference and impact on those other users, I will reduce my system back to a 20 megahertz channel. If I reduce back to a 20 megahertz channel, then I can no longer get those higher data rates. This is why people say when you're deploying 802.11n and you're deploying in the 2.4 gigahertz band, you very seldom can be able to deploy at the higher data rates and use a 40 megahertz channel. And so they recommend that if you want to get up to the higher data rates, then you should move up to the 5 gigahertz band. Now to explain why, we have this slide here. And you can see on this illustration the reason why the 5 gigahertz band is so much more advantageous for deploying 40 megahertz channels is simply that I have much more spectrum. So in the 2.4 gigahertz band in North America, you saw that I had 79 megahertz of spectrum. Whereas here in the 5 gigahertz band, I have significantly more spectrum. Now, the 5 gigahertz band in the United States is divided up in what we call the Uni 1, Uni 2, Uni 2 Extended, and the Uni 3 bands. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later on. But you can see here in the Uni 1 band, I've got 100 megahertz of spectrum and it's broken up into four 20 megahertz channels. So if I was deploying 802.11n and wanting to use 40 megahertz, I would deploy my primary channel on channel maybe 36 and my secondary one on channel 40. And then an adjoining access point, I would deploy on channel 44 as the primary and channel 48 as the secondary. And so I would go on using the Uni2 band, which has another four 20 megahertz channels. If I go to the extended Uni2 band, that has 11 20 megahertz channels that I can use. And then the Uni3 band, which is really for deployments outside, has yet another four 20 megahertz channels. So you can see I can really deploy a lot more 40 megahertz channels. And my chances are of other users interfering with me is a lot less than if I'm deploying in the 2.4 gigahertz band. So again, 8 to 11 n deployments up at the very high data rates, typically what you want to do is move to the 5 gigahertz band simply because there's so much more spectrum available. So now we have a grasp of the spectrum and the channel bandwidths. What I want to talk a little bit is about deployment of access points and how we do our frequency planning. And I mentioned to you one of the biggest decisions you're going to make is here's my access point and what frequency and what channel do I deploy that access point on. Now in this illustration, I'm looking at the 2.4 gigahertz band. And remember I have three non-overlapping channels. So when I'm looking at a large area that I want to get Wi-Fi deployment on, such as that hotel example, maybe this is an office or a manufacturing site, what I'm going to do is I'm literally going to think about deploying my cells with those non-overlapping channels. And you can see here that I'm using what's referred to in the industry as a one in three frequency reuse plan. And so I'm reusing channel one some distance away. So those are the cells that you can see indicated here in blue. And what I'm trying to do here is to make sure that two access points that are deployed on the same channel do not overlap. And so here you can see that by surrounding my channel 1 with channel 6 and 11 and then using channel 1 some distance away, I can reuse the same channel and get coverage right across my factory floor, across my office space, etc. 
you can see in this illustration, no matter how large my area is, in theory, I can cover it just by using these three frequency channels. So let's now take a closer look at reusing those frequencies. And in this illustration, you can see that I've got two access points, both deployed on channel 6. So they're both operating on the same frequency. And I have two stations where station 1 is talking to one access point and station 2 is talking to the other access point. Now you can see that once station 1 transmits, there's a possibility that that transmission could interfere with station 2's ability to receive the signal from its access point and vice versa. This is referred to as co-channel interference. So even though these two access points are physically separate and the cells are not overlapping, doesn't mean that we're not going to get interference between the two channels. And particularly where you're going to see that is for stations that are operating on the edge of the cell. And so what we're particularly concerned about is what is the edge boundary of the cell and what is the interference between these two access points that are operating on the same channel. And again, that's referred to as co-channel interference. Now, if I want to minimize co-channel interference, there's a couple of things that I can do. One, I can be very careful how I deploy my access points, which is why we want to do a site survey, is to work out the best place to put them to minimize my co-channel interference. I could adjust the power level on my access points. So if I reduce down the power level, I will reduce down the co-channel interference, but I will also reduce down the coverage, and that could introduce some holes. So I have to be carefully balancing between the coverage and my co-channel interference. Of course, if I was deploying in the 5 gigahertz band, I've got many more channels to, to use. So instead of doing a 1 in 3 frequency reuse plan, perhaps I can use a 1 in 4 frequency reuse plan and keep my cells much further apart. Once we've decided, oh, we're going to deploy in this frequency band on these channels, then one of the big questions becomes, how much should these overlap? And I want to make sure that I have no holes in coverage, but I don't want to have too much overlap because it's going to cause too much co-channel interference. Now, if you're doing data, you typically want to have your cell overlapping about 10 to 15 percent. If you're doing voice, about 20 percent. And here I'm talking about the 2.4 gigahertz band. Uh, voice is normally about 15 percent up in the 5 gigahertz band, and I'll explain that later. So let's talk about why voice and data have different overlapping channel requirements. With data, if I'm using the TCP IP protocol, then any lost packets will be retransmitted. And so I may suffer some latency, but I won't suffer the quality of my signal. I will still get all of the data that I need to. With voice, I'll be using the UDP IP protocols, and UDP does not retransmit lost packets. And so it's very important that I minimize the risk that I don't have coverage. And so I want to have my cells overlapping more in order to ensure the higher reliability of my connection. Now, of course, if my voice has a higher overlapping cells, then what I will suffer is I'll suffer a greater degree of co-channel interference. And again, site planning becomes absolutely critical because you have to balance it between making sure you have enough overlapping coverage to maintain a quality voice call, but enough channel separation not to suffer significant co-channel interference and degradate the performance.